Good morning, Christians. Welcome to Shepherd of the Hills, and to all you mothers, happy Mother's Day. May God, on this final Sunday in the season of Easter, fill us with his spirit and his joy as we worship him. Our order of service is printed before us in our service program. Our opening hymn is a treat, a new one. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, you'll find it as hymn 539. We have a soloist, Elizabeth, who's going to lead us through the first verse in Spanish, and then we'll sing together stanzas one through three in English. God bless you as you worship at Shepherd of the Hills.
Amen. Let us rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. My dear friends, we have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve one another as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sins and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt, your shame forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us to think those things that are true and to long for those things that are good, that we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson for this, the last Sunday in the season of Easter, is recorded for us in Acts, the 17th chapter, beginning at verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he has not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, he overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our psalm for this morning, Psalm 66. It's printed on page 6. It is entitled, At the work of your hands, O Lord, I lift up 
my voice in song, I sing for joy. Our second lesson for this last Sunday in the season of Easter is recorded in the first epistle from Peter, the third chapter, beginning at verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God, He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, those who were disobedient long ago, and God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Not the removal of dirt, from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. The word of the Lord. This time we normally have our children's church, and I'm just wondering to see if any children might be willing to come up today. Oh, there we go. Come on up for Children's Church. Good morning. Welcome, you guys. What a blessing it is to be with you, our young people in church. 
Here we are at our special place where God speaks to us through his word and tells us of his love for us. And it's our happy place. It's a good place to be. And I'm so glad you guys are here today. I was reading in our lesson today that we heard, it says, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Well, sometimes moms and dads and teachers, when you get older, ask you questions, and sometimes we know the answer, and sometimes, if you're anything like me, we're looking out the window and thinking of something else at the time. You ever been asked a question you don't know the answer to? Never? Oh, you guys are good, good students, good kids. Well, I, unfortunately, when I was your age, got asked a lot of questions. Where did you put this? I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I wasn't paying attention. Well, the Lord says, always have an answer if people ask you about the hope that you have. So, God does give us an answer. God so loved the world. Are you in the world? So he loves you. He doesn't only love us. He did something about us. He sent his son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him, do you believe in him? Will live with him in heaven. And not only that, he talks about the water that saved the people in the ark, and he tied it to the water of that place. So not only can you say, I believe in God because Jesus died for my sins, but you can also say, I am baptized. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you and you. Because you were baptized, you know that you are right with God. And God will always love you and always Let's say a prayer to that same God. Can we put our hands together? And we'll close with a loud amen. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved me. Keep me always in your hands. Help me always to know your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up. God bless you. Congregation now turns its attention to the hymn of the day, a hymn that is a prayer in a way to the Holy Spirit. It's hymn 591. It's entitled, O Holy Spirit, Grant Us Grace.
to that, we say, Amen. Amen. Let us rise for the reading of our gospel lesson. This morning's appointed gospel lesson takes us to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of St. John, beginning at verse 15. Jesus speaks, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Congregation may be seated. If you rewind in your mind, back to Easter Sunday, we spoke of the amazing things because of the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ that our Lord places into our Easter basket. Not the Cadbury eggs, not the hollow waxy bunnies, but gifts beyond our comprehension. And he continues through the season of Easter to pile more and more gifts into that basket. And we have one more thing for the Easter basket this final Sunday in the season of Easter. And that is the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14 through 16 take us to that evening in the upper room after the Lord instituted Holy Communion. He spoke at length to his disciples. And when you're speaking to your friends the night before your death, you are not speaking about the weather. These are important issues. And Jesus in these chapters points us specifically to the reality that he is, yes, leaving them, but he is not leaving them. He is sending to them the Holy Spirit. My dear friends, He says he is sending another advocate. Another advocate. That's a strange word. That word advocate is translated in many different ways in many different translations. It's sometimes translated counselor, sometimes helper, sometimes comforter. The Greek word is parakaleo. Para means to walk alongside, and kaleo means to call out. A parakaleo. A strange term, but a beautiful term, and an amazing gift. We're going to consider, as we meditate upon these words of Christ before us, the first parakaleo, the second parakaleo, and how to receive what the second parakaleo gives us. The first parakaleo, he says, I am sending you another advocate, parakaleo. He, Jesus, the one speaking these words, is the first parakaleo. 
in verse 15 through 16, the opening of the lesson we just heard, we hear, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another parakaleo, advocate, to help you and be with you forever. Parakaleo, to walk alongside, to call out. Jesus, indeed, as the old Methodist hymn suggests, he walks with us and he talks with us. He, he walks alongside of us. He was incarnate. God Almighty, the infinite, vast, and holy God through whom all the world was created, so loved us that he became one with us. He chose to be humbled, to be conceived in the womb of a virgin mother, to be born to us, to live on our land to breathe our poisoned air, to live beneath the sun that warms us day after day. He came here. He became one with us, and he walked with us as one fully human, but not as we walk. We walk in sin. We stumble about in darkness, but he walked in the light. He was the light. He was the Word, the very Lugus of God. And he walked upright. He walked in a way we do not walk. He walked sinless. He obeyed God wholly by thought, word, and deed. He fended off the temptations of the devil. He was tempted in every way as we are, but yet he was without sin. So he walked with us, and he talked with us. He kaleo, he called out. He instructed, he spoke of the kingdom of God. He re rebuked sin. Get behind me, Satan. But that's not all he did. He instructed, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. He taught us the very will and message of God. The salvation of God was upon his lips. He encouraged us, let the little children come to me and hinder them not, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. He healed our diseases. He reversed the effects of the curse. Everywhere he went, he forgave. And he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He got God's back. In the ultimate collision of God's love and God's justice on that hill outside the city, the Holy One became cursed for you and me. He took our sins upon Him. He drank the dregs of the cup of wrath that we have accumulated in our life. Every sin was placed on him. He got God's back, and he cried out, it is finished, it is paid. But he didn't stop speaking there. On the third day, he rose again alive. And what did he say? Be not afraid. Reach out and touch. I am not a ghost. I have flesh and blood. Give me a fish. He ate with them. He further instructed them, and then he ascended to heaven, where he is still not silenced, but still Kaleo calls out as our advocate, our intercessor. It's interesting, Jesus ascended to heaven. That'll happen on Thursday, and we'll celebrate it on Sunday. But as Jesus ascended to heaven, he didn't leave the place. There he speaks on behalf of his people, you and me, to his Father in heaven. He intercedes for us. And when I was a child, I had a misunderstanding of this. I hope you don't. But I imagine Jesus up there, the right hand of God, saying, yeah, I know. Look at Jeff. He said he wouldn't do that anymore. He said he wouldn't lie. He said he wouldn't cheat on his homework, but look, he's done it again. And I imagine that Jesus was saying, hey, God, give Jeff one more chance. Give Jeff one more chance. But even Jesus, and even God the Father, after, 
after dealing with me for months and years on end, it's terrifying to think, when will that chance end? But is that what Jesus does? It's not what Jesus does at all. He does intercede on behalf of you and me, but he doesn't say, give him, give her, give them one more chance. He says, with the scar still on his glorified body, he says, be just. I paid once for the sins of the world. I paid for his sins, your sins, my sins, her sins, all your sins. I paid. I paid. So God is faithful and just, and therefore he forgives all your sins because Christ has paid for them all. He is not saying, give them another chance. He is saying, they are mine. As surely as the scar on my palm indicates the price I paid, I have engraved your names on my palms forever. That's what he does. So he continues to walk alongside of us, and he continues to call out. He is the ultimate parakaleo. But he tells his disciples in that upper room that he is going away, but he is not leaving them. It's dizzying. He says, I am going. But the second parakaleo, the second advocate is coming, the Holy Spirit of God. And when he comes, I will come back to you, and the Father will be with me, you, and the Holy Spirit all together in one under your hood for the rest of eternity. And this boggles the mind. He says in verse 17, look at the pronouns. He, 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 him. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. The Holy Spirit is personal. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. The second parakaleo is the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God is not like the Force in Star Wars. It is a personal, divine inhabitant of your human heart and mine. And because of the second parakaleo, the Spirit has come to you in baptism, because the Holy Spirit has come to you, I know he has come to you because no one can say what you will say later in the service, Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Spirit of God. So he lives in you, he dwells within you, and because he lives within you and dwells within you, the Father and the Spirit and the Son are one with you, making you members of a new family forever. All right. Up way north in Canada, there is this weird little province called Newfoundland. Okay? And have any of you ever met a Newfie? You have? Could you understand them? Yes. Yeah, you could. Canadians can't even understand them very often. I mean, they speak a completely weird version of, of English. And they are fascinating people, but they live in the poorest area of Canada. They were fishermen for many years, but the area where they fished was called the, the Great Banks, right? And about a third of that belonged to Canada, and two-thirds of it were in international waters. And for generations, these people made their living fishing there. But about 20 years or so ago, well, actually more than that, the Canadian government realized that that tremendous wealth of fish was dying out, so they forbid all Canadians from fishing that. So these people were put out of work, and many of them went on welfare. They were people that worked hard, proud people, but people that were in a bad situation. Even as they watched the two-thirds of the fishery that were in international waters constantly being harvested by foreigners while they were forbidden from their livelihood. 
And it looks like a cute little town. It's about 10,000 people. It's nice and brightly covered, but these people were not rich. But on 9-11, something happened. I'm going to read you an account of what took place with these people. An argument sometimes is heard in U.S. political circles is that other countries take advantage of Americans. Anyone who makes that argument has never heard the story of how the residents of Gander, Newfoundland, opened their hearts and homes to stranded Americans after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack. On the morning of September 11, 2001, after two planes crashed into the World Trade Center and another hit the Pentagon, the Federal Aviation Administration closed U.S. airspace. In a phone call, Transportation Secretary Norman Minita ordered, get those blankety-blank planes down. Planes en route to the United States needed a place to go, and many landed in Canada. How were those American refugees treated as they landed in a foreign land? On September 11, 2001, almost 7,000 passengers and crew from 38 flights landed in the tiny town of Gander, Newfoundland a town of approximately 10,000 residents. The passengers who could find a TV or radio listened to the words of President George W. Bush. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, said President Bush, and no one will keep the light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature. The Americans on the plane did not realize that soon they would see the very best of human nature. After exiting the airplanes, the passengers went to makeshift facilities in a town of Gander put together to help the passengers. Within hours, the first sign arrived of how Canadians would treat the group of primarily American passengers left stranded by the world's events. American Clark and Roxanne Loper, along with their newly adopted child, wandered through the local Lions Club, which was housing airline passengers. A Gander resident, Roxanne, who they had never met, asked if the couple needed a ride to the store. Since the luggage of her and other passengers remained on the plane, she welcomed the offer at the store. Canadians asked if they were plain people and offered condolences once confirming that the passengers were American. Once back at the Lions Club, a stranger asked Roxanne if... Oh, um... Once back at the... Um... I skipped a paragraph here. At the store, okay, asked if they were Americans. Uh, They loaded up um, their goods, and everything was free. Once back at the Lions Club, a stranger asked Roxanne if she wanted to take a shower, even though there appeared no showers at the Lions Club. No, she said, you can come over to my house and shower, said the woman. Roxanne and Clark were grateful and accepted the offer. When Americans, Lisa Zale and business associate Sarah Wood needed supplies, they went to the Canadian Tire store. When they rolled their well-packed cart to the front and prepared to pay, the cashier asked them if they were from the planes. When they nodded, the cashier announced that they could just take the items they needed. Anything the stranded passengers needed, the store was happy to provide. Ladid reported other businesses and all the restaurants in town chipped in to help passengers, sending food to help stranded passengers. Local pharmacists supplied medicine to passengers whose medication was in their baggage and unavailable to them. Everything was given for free. Canadians didn't help only people. Local resident Bonnie Harris went to the lower compartments of the plane to feed stranded pets. She convinced authorities to place the pets in an empty airport hangar, and she and others in town pitched in to buy food to take care of the animals. Many people in Gander opened their homes and gave passengers a place to sleep. The president of the local airport authority was surprised when he came home late and planned to sleep in the guest room so as not to disturb his wife and found uh, that an older woman that he didn't know was already sleeping there. The townspeople helped children cope by organizing a large party complete with games and cake and costume characters. The store manager at the local store located toys at a warehouse and borrowed a fire truck to collect stuffed animals and other items to hand out to the displaced children. One couple recalls carrying a child down the street when a local woman ran out and gave them a stroller. 
The principal opened the local schools to stranded passengers to allow them computers to contact, contact loved ones in America and elsewhere. All the students had a week off, and their chief role and requirement was to take care of the visitors. Residents of the town stripped their beds of sheets and donated them to the local shelters. Denise Gray Felder, who worked for the Rockefeller Foundation, noticed the towels people had donated for the passengers. She asked one of the women how everyone was going to reclaim their towels once the passengers left. The woman looked at her as if it was an odd question. It doesn't matter, she said. The selfishness of the town people gave Gray Felder chills. A local townsperson responded, I mean, Newfoundland and Labrador, up through the years, we've never had a lot. What we've had, we've always shared. And I think that's the way in which we were brought up. When we saw what was happening, we just said, well, we've got to help. So poor people gave their all to support the visitors, a huge number of them that descended upon their little town. They gave from the little they had to be a blessing to the guests that honored them. Well, what is the point of this particular story? Well, as people without much offered everything to serve others on 9-11, we have to ask ourselves, do I, do we walk about in amazed bewilderment and astounded joy at the guest that we have living under our roof, the guest that lives within us. None other than the Paracleo of God. Do we walk around in stunned amazement? Do we order our lives by the reality of the guest within that we have? Look at what God has piled into our Easter basket. Not only a new life, hope, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, joy, and peace, but he has given us none other than the Paracleo, the Holy Spirit, the very being of God, to dwell in us and with us. I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you, says Jesus. Second Peter tells us, we are partakers, we, you, me, are partakers of the divine nature. All this courtesy of the second parakaleo, the Spirit of God. Now let's just take a moment and try to unpack that word parakaleo alongside calls out. There was something in ancient days called a paraclete. Okay? So if I were let's say, the father of a home. My oldest son likely would be the one that would carry on the business, but before he could do that, I would assign to him a paraclete, a manager within my household, that would take him through the family business, every aspect of it, from planting the fields to harvesting the grapes to supplying the jars for the olive oil to working the press, to the inventory, to the accounting, to the bookkeeping, every aspect of that business, this man would be tied to my son so that he would be equipped to take over my business. That doesn't really happen so much anymore. Not exactly like that. But I want to use myself as an example because I've been thinking about this. Now, I was a pretty good student when I was in my younger ages, but things started to slip for me in the seventh grade. The seventh grade was a hard grade, and it demanded more work and discipline than I was used to. But I had a very good friend. I had a couple, but one particular good friend. His name is Mike Bourne. He was a Jesus boy, like he was a Christian. But he was straight A's and everything. He was an athlete. And let's just imagine for a moment my dad hired, went to Mike Bourne's parents and said, I want your son to live with my son Monday to Friday. 
I want him to be tied to my son so that my son gets some of the discipline that your son has. That would have been good for me, and I probably would have liked it. And the parents agree, and my dad says to Mike Bourne, I want you to put this in your pocket and use it as needed. So he does. And on Monday, he rides the bus home with me. And he says, Jeff, you tell me you do the, your homework sometimes on the bus. Why aren't you doing your homework? And I go, well, that's, that's the morning bus. And, and that's the homework I didn't do the night before. He goes, well, you got this ride home. Let's start your homework now. And I'm like, all right. So he's crossing my will already. And then I get home, and it's almost 4 o'clock, and at 4 o'clock, a TV show I like is on, WKRP in Cincinnati. And I want to watch that. And he goes, no, no, we're, we're not doing that. I'm like, what? You know those words from the spelling test that you were working on the bus? Let's see if you know them. So he gives me a little quiz, and I get, you know, out of 20, I get 18 right. I go, that's better than I usually do. Right on. He goes, oh, we're not going to accept that. It's got to be 20 out of 20 every time. Work on those two you got wrong. I do. And then he says, get changed. And I'm like, get changed to what? Sweatpants, running shoes? Okay. What are we doing? Oh, we're going to go for a run. Are you crazy? He goes, is this what I do? And your dad says to make you do what I do. So we go for a run and he leaves me behind because he's a track guy and I'm not. And then sweating, I come back to the house and we sit and do homework. We don't watch TV. And I'm like, really? Really? This is what you do? And you're making me do this? He's crossing my will now, right and left. And then eventually I'm going to get angry and frustrated, upset at him. And I'm going to go into a tailspin of anger and frustration. And then that will lead me into guilt. And then he pulls out this picture of Jesus. And he tells me to read what it says. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That's Romans 8. And then 1 John 3, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So my paraclete, Mike Bourne, my wife's like texting to see where he is now. I don't know, I've lost track with him, but he is a great guy. If he were my paraclete, would I be blessed to this very day by that, I, I would be. I would be. He had a lot he could have taught me. And that would bear dividends to this very day. The paraclete, the second paraclete, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And what does he do? He is the spirit of truth. And so all God's word is inspired. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's job is to direct us to truth, to cross our wills, to say, you can't do this. This is wrong. This is not in accordance with who you are. But then the Holy Spirit's primarily, primary job is to always point to Jesus. He died. He took your sins away. You are forgiven. He lives here. You are one with him. Nothing can separate you from his love. And even if your spirit says otherwise, the spirit, the paraclete, overrides you and assures you that you are a child of God. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. He is the best friend you could ever have. And he dwells richly within us. It is his job to point us again and again to Jesus and to his truth in God's holy word. So how do we tap in to what the second paraclete, the Holy Spirit, brings to us? We feed the right dog. I used this illustration with parents at graduation for our preschool. There was a, a Cherokee leader, a Christian man who was interviewed and asked to describe his life and he says, in my life, there are like two dogs that dwell within me. One is the good dog. One is the bad dog. I have two dogs, too. And one is good and one was not so good. But they live within. And the good dog wants what is right, justice and selflessness and honor and integrity and love and service and 
kindness. Uh, the evil dog who wants what is selfish and violent and angry, it brings frustration. And the person interviewing this particular chief said, which dog is winning? He said, it's always the one I feed the more. So how do we get the gifts of the paraclete into our life, the parakaleo? We feed him. What does he dine upon? The means of grace, holy communion, baptism, and the word and promises of God. Are we feeding that dog in our lives? Are we making the most of the opportunity to hear and to marvel and to be blown over by the truth of the Spirit of God who speaks to us through his word? Do we feed him by dining daily upon the words and promises of God and Holy Scripture? My friends, this will change your life. In a million different ways, I with so I had more discipline or more patience or more kindness or more fruits of the Spirit. How do they come? They come by feeding that good dog within. Feed the Spirit. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. Notice that statement. It sneaks by us. Most religion in the world says, if you keep my commandments... God says, I will love you. God shows his love. He died out on that cross and he rose again to demonstrate to you nothing can separate you from his love. Do you love him too? If you do, listen and keep his commandments. Stick that parakaleo in your Easter basket too. Amen. Now the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in him until life everlasting. We continue at this time to meditate upon that parakaleo within that best friend that is ours, the Holy Spirit, as we meditate during our musical offering. We love you. Accept these gifts and use them to proclaim your peace the world over. Amen. I invite you to congregation to rise as we join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. They're printed on page 9 of our service program. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated at this time. It's not usually our tradition in Lutheran worship to be seated during the prayers and the Lord's Prayer, but in the new hymnal, that is becoming a new thing, so we're going to try it and get used to it. God hears us if we're sitting or we're standing in our prayers, so let us be seated as we pray. Let us pray. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son, by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and by the faithful testimony of the apostles. You have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us to see them with the eyes of faith. Through your pericoleo, the Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it, that we, may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people, grant that we may also be illumined by the Spirit of truth through your word. And so keep us in the one and only faith. Help us to love, to feed the Spirit within, and you will bring the fruits. Preserve us from all assaults in our soul. Deliver us from doubt and despair and preserve us from worldly recklessness and distraction. Forgive the sins of your people. Strengthen the doubting and the faithless. Bring back the forgetful and the wayward and comfort the anxious and the distressed with your word. Your word is truth. Lord, on this last Sunday of Easter, hear us as we bring you our private petitions. As we go from this place of grace today, grant peace and rest to all. We also thank you for the gift of motherhood. On this Mother's Day, we celebrate how you have provided so many of the gifts that you have given to us through our mothers. We thank you for them. We ask you to bless them and bless our families everywhere through the work of mothers. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the parakaleo, the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Now I'm going to invite you to rise because our final hymn has only one stanza. It is, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We sing better, I think, as we stand. Hymn 617 and we have an opportunity to greet one another thereafter. Praise God.
Good morning, everyone. I know I, I spoke too long today, so I will try to be very brief. Happy Mother's Day to our mothers. You notice a little picture there and a passage. God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I was laying on my bed last night and thinking about Mother's Day and thinking about this passage. I live next door, and if you look at the parsonage, there are a couple things that run into that building. There's electricity, which is important. That's the Holy Spirit. We spoke about him today. But then there are two other things. There's a little gas line, and then there's a big water line. I think we dads are like the gas line. I kind of wish my daughters were here because they'd laugh at that for obvious reasons. But the gas does bring heat, and it does make the shower more comfortable. But without the water, we wouldn't survive. And that's the work of mothers. Thank you, mothers, for all your service to our families, all the blessings that you bring into our lives. Have a great Mother's Day. We don't have Bible class today. We have a celebration. We have mimosas and muffins. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you next Sunday.